Today it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sean Hawley, who graduated at a date that she wishes to remain undisclosed um, from our department. And she used her English degree to go on to become a lawyer. So she's currently a defense attorney um, and partner at Kinsella Weitzman Iser Cum Poly LLP, which is one of Hollywood's top entertainment law firms. She received her undergraduate degree in English at UCLA and then went on to attend Southwestern University School of Law. Sean Hawley first came to prominence as a member of the OJ defense team, and she's went on to represent numerous celebrity clients, including Kanye West, Justin Bieber, Lindsay Lohan, and the Kardashian-Jenner family. Hawley has appeared on several television shows and served as the chief legal correspondent for the E! Exclamation mark Network, which I'm sure you know, and has also been a visiting faculty lecturer at the Benjamin N. Cardozo Law School of Yeshiva University in New York City for the past 20 years. Um, Sean is a person of incredible energy, wit, insight and humor and it's wonderful to have her back here today as an alumna to tell her a little bit about where her career took her after her degree from UCLA. So thank you Sean for being here. Hi. First let me congratulate you fabulous, amazing, hardworking, high achieving badasses. <laughs> you must know that this is a very, very big day marking a major achievement in your gorgeous, accomplished lives. And I hope you are proud of yourselves. I join your families, friends, and this wonderful university in congratulating you and I share in their pride. When I was asked to be your keynote speaker, I turned to the wisdom of two people for whom I have a great deal of respect, Howard Stern and Billie Eilish. <laughs> Howard Stern interviewed Billie Eilish on his radio show and asked her how she felt when she was invited to host Saturday Night Live. You see, she wasn't asked to be the musical guest, which is her comfort zone. She was asked to be the host, not her comfort zone. And she said she was totally freaking out and scared to death, but she had to say yes, because it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And she knew that if she said no, she would regret it forever. And that's kind of what happened to me. <laughs> this is not my comfort zone, but I knew that I had to say yes, because if I said no, I would regret it forever. So she said that when she said yes, she started freaking out immediately. And when I said yes, I started freaking out immediately. Just like her. <laughs> As luck, or really global unluck would have it, I got a couple of reprieves. I was first asked to do this in 2020, and that's when I first started freaking out. But then the global pandemic came and shut it down. And then the same thing happened in 2021. I was asked to come do this, started freaking out, and then the global pandemic came and shut it down. But I guess third time is a charm. And here we are, post-pandemic, sort of, and post-freak out, sort of. So I was born in LA, and I've lived my whole life within a 10-mile radius of Farmer's Market on 3rd and Fairfax. And when it was time to look at colleges, and really even now, I had no desire to move away from that 10 mile radius. I mean, it's a pretty good 10 mile radius. So I thought to myself, if I can get into UCLA, I mean, that's really the only choice, especially since I'm not aware of any other highly regarded major universities within a 10 or even 20 mile radius of 3rd and Fairfax. That's right. <laughs> So UCLA it was, and I honestly had the time of my life here. I met my best friend Kenneth, who is here sitting in the front row with my husband and daughter. And we were stackies at URL together, which I think is now called YRL. And we had breakfast together almost every morning at North Campus. 
And he was a political science major, and I, of course, was an English major. And so we'd never had any classes together. But before we graduated, we really, really wanted to take a class together. So we just had to figure out what would fit within both of our schedules. And the only thing that fit within both of our schedules was a class called Library and Information Science. And neither of us had any idea what Library and Information Science was, but it fit within our mutual schedule. So we're like, OK, we're going to take it. And so we did. And then Kenneth loved that class so much that he ended up coming back to UCLA, getting his master's in library and information, information science. And he has an extremely successful and rewarding career as an archivist at the Metropolitan Transit Authority here in LA. And he travels all over the world speaking on this topic. Oh. So Kenneth, <laughs> I, on the other hand, had no idea what I wanted to do. My course of study as a UCLA English major had taught me a lot about how to critically analyze the writings of others, how to express myself in writing, and how to dive deep into prose and poetry. And I felt like my BA in English had somehow prepared me for both everything and nothing. So I figured, I'll go to law school. Surely these skills will serve me well in law school. And I was completely right. So I went to law school. I got into Hastings and Southwestern, but only one of them was in my 10 mile radius. So obviously I was going to Southwestern because it's at Wilshire and Vermont. <laughs> so by my second or third month of law school, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm in law school because it turns out I really want to be a lawyer. And I also decided what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer. But during my second year of law school, my beloved criminal law professor, Karen Smith, encouraged me to consider interviewing for a summer clerkship in the LA County Public Defender's Office. I really didn't know what that was, but she knew me, I trusted her, I loved her, she knew my strengths and weaknesses. She had been a public defender, and she said, you can still be an entertainment lawyer, but this is a job that you should take. And so I applied, and I got the job. And for my very first day as a public defender law clerk, I knew that I had found my calling and my purpose. And I just want to tell you a really quick story about that first day as a public defender law clerk because it completely changed my entire life. So that first day I was assigned to work in Department 30 at the Criminal Courts Building downtown, which is the main criminal courthouse in LA. And Department 30 is the felony arraignment court, which is to say that anyone in the sort of greater Los Angeles area who's been arrested for a felony within the preceding 72 hours and who had not bailed out is going to have their very first court appearance, which is called the arraignment in that courtroom. And my job was to go into the holding cell and talk to the people who had been arrested and were waiting to be heard in court for their arraignment. And because it was 1987, almost everyone there was charged with possession of raw cocaine. And so I go into the holding cell and it was really just an assault on my senses. It was hot, it smelled bad, it was loud, and it was packed with men. And all of that was a shock to the senses. But the greatest shock of all was seeing that all of the men packed into this holding cell, all of them, were black or brown, every single one. So I interviewed them one by one and told them, you're charged with possession of rock cocaine, and they would say one by one, I'm guilty. I want to plead guilty. And I said, okay, I need to write down what happened so I can give it to your public defender. And they would say, one by one, that what happened is they were walking down the street and the police just drove up to them, told them to stop, told them to put their hands up against the car, searched them and found rock cocaine. None of these men had any idea that this was a violation of their Fourth Amendment constitutional rights. They had no idea that the police themselves were breaking the law by doing that without any guile at all, they thought I possessed rock cocaine and so therefore I'll plead guilty. I then read the police reports and one by one they all said virtually the same thing. That they, the police, were driving down the street and they saw the suspect, this person I was speaking with, and that person looked in their direction, looked scared, and then reached in their pocket and threw rock cocaine on the sidewalk right in front of the police. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? Who would believe that? That is insane. But the police knew that if they told the truth of what they really did, that the case would get thrown out because that would be a violation of the Constitution. And they, the police, were also breaking the law by doing that, and they weren't allowed to do that. 
So they had made up this story to circumvent all of that. I was like, this is insane. <laughs> This isn't justice, this isn't justice for all, this isn't equal protection under the law, this is not okay. So I decided right then and there, I don't wanna be an entertainment lawyer anymore, I wanna be a public defender. So I finished law school, passed the bar, and I became a public defender. And from day one as a public defender, I was in court defending people against the mighty weight of the government and fighting for justice and liberty for people who needed representation and advocacy. And that was a tremendous honor. And I'd been a public defender for five years when Johnny Cochran saw me in court and recruited me to come to his law firm. His law firm at that time was a civil rights police misconduct law firm, didn't do criminal law at all. And I loved criminal law and I knew that I would be giving it up to go to Johnny Cochran's office, but Johnny Cochran was the man within my, my 10 mile radius. So I left the public defender's office and I went to Johnny's office and Johnny would say that he hired me even though I knew nothing about the sort of law that his firm practiced because he saw the passion with which I was doing my job as a public defender. So I was learning civil litigation um, at Johnny's office when the O.J. Simpson case came to the firm and I was one of two lawyers in the firm with criminal law experience and so Johnny put me on the O.J. case full time and took all of my other cases away from me and for the next year and a half I was on the O.J. Simpson dream team um, which was Pretty awesome. Years later, after Johnny died and the firm was thrown into disarray, Howard Weitzman, who until his death last year was one of the top entertainment lawyers in town, recruited me to come to his firm, which was an entertainment and business litigation boutique. Howard had also seen me in court as a public defender, and he had known me in connection with the OJ trial. And so even though I really didn't know anything about entertainment litigation, just like I hadn't known anything about civil rights police misconduct litigation when I went to Johnny's office. I said yes, I took a chance. And Howard, just like Johnny, years before that, took a chance on me. And for basically the same reason. Because it was clear that I loved and cared deeply about my job and my clients. I've been at that firm now for 16 years and I'm a name partner. Which is to say after all this time you could say I'm an entertainment lawyer. But if I'm keeping it real, I don't consider myself an entertainment lawyer. I consider myself someone in the service business. I help people who are going through a very, very difficult time. And it's more than just handling their case. It's therapy, it's counseling, it's hand-holding, it's strategizing. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm looking for a sense of justice and fairness. And I'm telling you these stories because I'm told a successful commencement speaker draws upon their past experiences to offer a few pearls of wisdom while inspiring you to do great things. So with that in mind and at heart, here's what I want to say to you. Keep an open mind. Even if you know exactly what you want to do in life, leave at least some room for the possibility that you might be wrong, that there might be something else that you don't even know about that could be that thing for you. I remember when my daughter, who's here, was graduating from elementary school, and we parents were going on tours of the fancy middle schools, and at one of the presentations, the head of school said, the professions and careers your kids will have haven't even been invented yet. And the same may be true for you. And if you're open to exploring new things, or trying new things, or taking a class, or a course, or an internship, something you've never even heard of, doing a job you never considered, it could be that new unexplored experience is your jam, your sine qua non, your raison d'etre, the thing that you love the most. But if you're closed off and unwilling to try something new or different or previously unknown to you, you could be missing out on the love of your life. The things that you learned as an English major here at UCLA are invaluable and will serve you well forever, whatever you decide to do. You have no idea how many times over the years in lots of important meetings and even in court hearings that I have been asked, what are the Canterbury Tales about? I'm joking. No one has ever asked me that. <laughs> but seriously, the ability to analyze something you have read, to find insight and deeper meaning in it, whatever it is, is a skill that served me well in law school and continues to serve me well as a lawyer. And beyond that, to have the ability to express your thoughts and ideas based on your critical analysis is a skill I don't think you can get in any other discipline. 
recently I found myself in many situations where I'm co-counsel in big firms, big cases, and Ivy League lawyers, and I'm always the one called upon to give the oral argument, or write the brief, or make the final edits, or add the final flourishes. I'm always the best writer in the room. <laughs> I read an article a few weeks ago about the famous lecture given by beloved MIT professor Patrick Winston to his university students just before he died. In his introduction, he drew attention to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which calls for court-martial for any officer who sends a soldier into battle without a weapon. Winston says there ought to be a similar protection for students, namely, that no one should go through life without being armed with the ability to properly communicate. Because as Winston put it, your success in life will be determined largely by your ability to speak, your ability to write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. And while Professor Winston recognized the value of brilliant ideas, he placed even higher importance on the ability to communicate those ideas in an impactful manner. After four years of study in the English department at this outstanding university, you are all properly armed with all the skills you need to succeed in whatever field you choose. If you keep an open mind and follow your instincts to find your passion, I promise you will find happiness and success in all the ways that matter. Finally, I want to read a quote to you which was written by F. Scott Fitzgerald. For what it's worth, it's never too late, or in my case, too early, to be whatever you want to be. There's no time limit. Start whenever you want. You can change or stay the same. There are no rules to this thing. We can make the best or the worst of it. I hope you make the best of it. I hope you see things that startle you. I hope you feel things you never felt before. I hope you meet people who have a different point of view. I hope you live a life you're proud of, and if you're not, I hope you have the courage to start all over again. Congratulations, beautiful, bodacious Bruins. May the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs>